Colossians chapter number three, and let's look at verse one. Are you there? All right. You there? You there, Priscilla? You sure? All right. <laughs> Colossians three and one. It says this. If then, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ sits on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Y'all with me? Verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, and let's look at verse 16. 2 Corinthians, hallelujah, and chapter 4, verse 16. Are you there? All right, give me just a moment to get there. <laughs> All right, where are we at? 2 Corinthians, aha, uh -huh. 4 and 16. Lord, why I can't find where I'm trying to get to today? Of all, okay, here we go. All right. Ain't that crazy? I tell you to get there and I'm still over here lost. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, and we're going to look at verse 16. Everyone's there? All right, it says this. Hallelujah. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is what? renewed day by day for our light affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and what eternal weight of glory while we look not at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen for the things which are seen are temporal but the things which are not seen are eternal you may be seated hallelujah father in the name of jesus speak to us today god open up our eyes open up the eyes of our heart open up the ears of our spirit let us hear what it is that you would say to us today in jesus name amen amen i want to talk to you just quickly i'm not going to be long before you just going to just give you something that the Lord uh, put on my heart to share with us this morning. But I want to talk to you about our eternal focus. And I want to talk to you about how God has given us so great a salvation. But what he has given to us is not so that we can st stay with our focus on this world. Amen, somebody. Anybody been saved? been changed been born again this is the beauty when you get saved God, you know y'all know God knows everything about you God knows everything about you. He knows your thoughts are far off before they even hit the recesses of your mind. He knows. God knew all of your shortcomings, all of your faults, your failures, hallelujah, where you would need help. God knew everything about you, and yet he still chose you. He still chose to save you. He still called you from your mother's womb. Before the foundation of the world, he said, yeah, that was mine. Hallelujah. And this is the beauty that God, hallelujah, before we were even formed in our mother's womb, he knew everything about us and then created a way of escape for us and then said, I'm going to fill in the gaps of your life that where you fall short, I'm going to give you my strength. And where you fall short, I'm going to give you my peace. And where you need me, I'm going to be right there to be the helper hallelujah he knew everything about your life and yet he still chose you you know God is not like man God's not like human one of the greatest scriptures in our Bible is so beautiful God is not a man hallelujah men are fickle humans are fickle we are uh, people full of opinions people who have one opinion today and a whole different opinion tomorrow you know it's hard to know if you can even count on people some days but but God he's not like man you know men hallelujah humans will uh, uh, they will turn their back on you in a minute they will look at you with your flaws and your issues and say I don't know if you got what it takes hallelujah but the father 
the all-knowing God, the uncreated creator, hallelujah, he says, not only do I see what I put in you, not only do I see your flaws and your issues and your mistakes, but I see your potential and I see everything that I created you to be and I know that you can't see it for yourself at times. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get in partnership with you and in relationship with you until I can draw it all out of you. Hallelujah. God has given us so great a salvation. And if God says that I see all of that and I'm with you, then I'm going with God. I'm going with God every time because the scripture is clear that he that begun a good work in me is faithful to complete it even unto that great day. The hand of God is working in us both to will and to do according to his own good pleasure, which means this. I can't even do it in my own strength. All that I desire to be and all that I hope to be, even as I come to know him more and there begins to be a desire in my heart to know him more and to serve him more and to walk uprightly before him. I can't even do that in my own strength, but thanks be unto God that it's not even me that has to do it because it's him that is doing the work in me. Are y'all with me? So God is doing this great work in us, but what you have to know is this, that in this world that we live in, uh, there is a devil. Satan is roaming to and fro throughout the earth, seeking who he may devour. And I want you to know this, that from the very beginning, from the fall, before the fall of man, Satan has been trying to distract us. He has been trying to get us caught up in the things of this world to get our gaze and our focus and our attention off of our Father. He is constantly working and he is putting in what seems to be now over time. Y'all know the devil's time is appointed. And the scripture says in the book of Revelation, it might be Revelation or Daniel, one of the books, it says that I saw an angel coming with a great chain, coming to bind the wicked one. The devil's time, he's not, he's not, uh, 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 he doesn't live forever. He has but a space of time that God has appointed and his judgment is coming. Satan knows this, and so what he is doing is working overtime to distract the mind of humanity. To get you caught up in all kinds of things, even if it is church. So that you are busy and bound. So that you are active, but not, uh, uh, not uh, accelerating. So that you are not connected to the one that has called you. You look in the Garden of Eden and here is Adam and Eve and Eve, you know, stumbles upon this tree in the center of a, the garden. How many know the story? Right. You've heard the stories, but I mean, it's an old story, right? <laughs> God put Adam and Eve in, the, in this garden and he said that you have free reign over this garden. Now, I don't know how many of you in here garden. I'm not that much of a garden. I tried to be a little bit and then everything died and I got a little discouraged. So I said, well, I'll try again next year, you know. But my mom is a gardener and she gardens all the time and she, she really just loves it. She, she has all this stuff in her garden and she just built these like, I think like six or eight big planter boxes in her big backyard. And then her husband bought her a little greenhouse and assembled a little greenhouse in the middle of the, of the planter boxes. And when me and uh, Zion went this past summer, she was taking Zion around her little garden, showing him all the stuff that was in there. And she was just thriving off of this little garden. And she loved it. She said, I'm going to make you some sauce so we can have some chips with my tomatoes. I said, all right, mama. But, but here's the beautiful thing. God gave Adam and Eve a massively huge garden filled with everything that they would ever need. And the only instruction, this is what's crazy. God said, you can be fruitful, multiply. I'm going to give you food, you can have sex and have children, build a family, and you have everything you need. Is that too much for y'all? Y'all all right? Okay, I just said S-E-X. Sorry, I don't know if that bothers somebody. But y'all with me? They had everything that they could need. I'm sure it was beautiful. It probably had some kind of temperature control, unlike this room today. Amen. And it was such a beautiful thing that the songwriter picked it up and said, he walks with me and he talks with me. 
and he tells me I'm his own. And the joy we shared as we tarried there, none other shall ever know. They walked with God and they talked with God and they had fellowship with him unhindered. But they were given one instruction. And that one instruction was, hey, listen, you can have all of this, but there's this tree in the center of the garden. The knowledge of good and evil. I don't want you to touch that tree. Just don't touch it. And they were content with that. They were fine with that. And then here comes Satan. What the scripture says, uh, uh, the serpent of old. He is a subtle devil. That word subtle, you got to understand the subtlety of Satan. Satan doesn't always just punch you in the face and say, sin. <laughs> but it comes subtly, smooth. Smooth talking. Just want to have a conversation. Just want to get in your ear. Just want to get into your thoughts. And he says to Eve, he says, oh, hey. How you doing, Eve? Eve, I noticed that you like, you know, to garden. You like everything that's in this garden. You like the fruit of it. But have you considered this tree in the middle? Eve said, yeah, but uh, God told us we can't touch that tree. She was content with that. Now, I want you to think about this. She had never knew disobedience. She had never knew correction. She had never knew any of that stuff. It didn't exist yet. And then here comes Satan and he begins to question. He just wants to cause her to question. Did God say? He begins to say, did he really? Are you sure? Is that what he really meant? When, when God said, and, and, and Satan said to her, uh, surely God wouldn't cause you to die. God knows that if you touch the tree, then you'll be enlightened like he is. And you'll have the knowledge that he has. And you'll be like him. Surely you won't die. God wouldn't do that to you. He's a really good God. And he began to convince her up out of her promise and her relationship with God. I just want you to see this morning that from the very beginning, the devil has sought to distract you from the voice of your father, from the voice of his instruction. That's why to this day, the repercussions of that disobedience are being uh, felt. But Satan didn't stop just at the entrance of sin. He's not going to stop until he feels he has won, which, you know, we've read the end of the book. He don't win right but this is what's happening to this day Satan is still trying to get into your mind convince you that you're not enough convince you that you don't have what it takes convince you that there's no purpose for your life convince you that you're this or that you're that or if he can't get you to wear yourself out in your mind then he'll get your mind distracted and you'll go into this weird stuff uh, as if to say you know there are many paths to God many ways to God hallelujah we'll just build for ourselves our own God hallelujah or he will get you into this thing where you can come just close enough to God to see him, but not to be actively in relationship with him. People do this in the church all the time. That's why we got thousands upon thousands of denominations today. You can walk down just a few blocks from here and you're going to press at least four or five churches. Hallelujah. And many churches who fall under categories of denominations or even non-denominational because that's just as religious as many other sects of the church today it's quiet in this church and we have built entire revelations around entire churches around certain revelations and so you have people say oh I'm a Baptist I only go with the Baptist or I'm oneness I only hang with oneness or I'm this or I'm that and so we have these sects of people or groups of people hallelujah who claim that we know God and we box God in just comfortable enough, enough to look at him, but not to be with him. This is the setup, y'all, and I want you to get this. The scripture tells us that, that, that there was a, a, a rich man and a poor man. And they, the, the, the rich man, hallelujah, I'm, I messed up the scripture, but the rich man, he had lifted up his eyes in hell. 
And the scripture said that he was in hell and he was tormented in the flame. And from that place of torment, he could see God. And he could talk to him. This, this rich man tormented in that flame, he looks up and he sees God and he says, hey, God, if you could please, I see you up there. Matter of fact, I see that poor man who I overlooked, that beggar, Lazarus, if you could just let Lazarus, it's hot down here. He said, if you could please, I'm being tormented. If you could just let Lazarus dip his finger in some water and give me a drop. God's response to this man tormented in hell. It's in your Bible. Go read it. His response to him is this. I would love to help you. But between me and you, there's a great gulf and it's fixed. This is the thing, y'all. Eternity is soon to come. We don't know when it will come for us. God forbid, hallelujah, it could be today, it could be tonight, it could be tomorrow. We don't know, hallelujah, what tomorrow holds or when our next day or when our day will come. Hallelujah. But we get very busy being about our life. Nothing wrong with it because we all are doing things to, to better ourselves. We're having families and, 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 you know, all of this stuff, doing things to care for our communities and our families, and, and, and we're busy, right? But here's the thing about life. Life has a tendency, if you are not careful, to get on top of you. Life has a tendency to rob you of the joy of your salvation. Life has a tendency to get in the way of God. Life has a tendency, even your pursuits. Some of you in this room have businesses and endeavors and ideas and dreams and things you want to accomplish and goals before God, which is not wrong. But when you allow those things to take the place of not just your vision of him, but your communion with him, it robs you of your view of eternity and it takes you out of the presence of God are you with me he said in 2nd Corinthians 4 and 16 he said for which cause we faint not but though our outward man perish yet our inward man is renewed day by day the call of God as we draw close to him in fellowship in relationship is he said I'm going to renew you I'm going to renew your strength and renew your mind and renew your heart though your outward man perish Y'all ever been, I'm, I'm talking to some born again people here this morning. Y'all ever been tired in your physical body, worn out in your heart, worn out in your mind, but your spirit got some kind of energy, got some kind of strength stirred up on the inside. There is a, an ability from God that though this outward man perish. And let me speak to those of you that are pushing 50, 60, 70 in the room, maybe older. Your outward body will perish. You will feel your strength begin to wane. From what I'm told, I'm, you know, 33, so I'm starting to get up there where stuff's starting to make noise. But they tell me the more I keep pushing, you're going to start feeling things you ain't feel before. <laughs> right? And, and so uh, as you progress, your body may begin to diminish. Your outward man may perish. You may not look the way you used to look and things may not be in places they used to be. Oh, it's quiet, church. <laughs> Though this outward man perish, that inward man is called to be renewed day by day by day. And here's the thing, y'all. When you come to Jesus and you have an encounter with him and he, and he causes you to be born again and he wakes your spirit up and fills you with the Holy Ghost and puts a fire down on the inside of your belly, the scripture tells us that we go from faith to faith and from glory to glory. This is the thing. When I got saved, and I hear Pastor Brian tell this testimony all the time, people tell you, you know, when you first get born again, they, they, they look at you like, oh, look, new believers in the honeymoon phase. You know, they're on fire, real passionate. We'll leave all that zeal for the young folk. What? 
That's crazy. Faith to faith, glory to glory, strength to strength. I don't know about you, but I want to be able to get into my 80s, 90s and still have a fire burning for, for the Lord. But if you let life wear you out, you get settled in life and you just say, well, you know, I'm just so old and you know, I've had my day. Hallelujah. This is the thing. People will look at you and they'll say, you know, you got to be careful. You don't want to be too heavenly minded. We heard the text in Colossians. He said, set your mind on things above and be renewed in your spirit. Corinthians said, we, we don't look at things that are seen, but things that are unseen. And when because, listen, when you are born again, you understand your citizenry comes from another world. Though I am an American in this physical body. Hallelujah. My first citizenship is in glory. I am born again. This is not my home. I'm a sojourner passing through. I don't plan to be an American in eternity. Amen. Hallelujah. But I will be his, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people, hallelujah, hand selected by God, his royal priesthood. Hallelujah. Here's the thing, y'all. My citizenship, it, it comes from him, which means this. I operate from a place of eternal, I want to say eternality. Hallelujah. Which means all of our belief, all of our strength, all of our provision, all of our ability, it comes from another place. You might look at your bank account and say, I don't know. <laughs> some of you might. You might be in a good place, but some of you... Like myself at times have, have looked at it and said, I don't know, Jesus. And where it's going to come from. I don't know what we're going to do. But because I'm born again, and because I walk uprightly before the Lord, and because, let me side note this in for the people that think that, you know, we just heavenly minded and God does all the work. But because he's teaching me to steward my money, because he's teaching me to steward my life and steward my resources and use wisdom and be a person of skill and business and acumen and be able to accomplish. But that's not where I put my strength I, or, or, or my or my uh, 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 trust. I put my trust in the fact that he is the God who sits outside of time. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It all belongs to him. And because I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed baked for bread i will not be moved are y'all with me it's a question of your gaze it's a question of your focus it's a question of what you are looking at and from what perspective you are living if you live from a carnal or a worldly perspective you will be limited in your scope i was talking to those of you that have served the lord for a number of years so let me get back to you I understand, hallelujah, that life, if you keep on living it, life can rob you of so much. It can rob you of your strength. It can rob you of your zeal. It can rob you of your hope. Don't y'all know, if you think about when were the days when you were really wild for the Lord, when were the days where you really stepped out on faith and believed, and what is the difference between that day and today? Is it because you've experienced some things? Is it not true that as humans and we go through life and we experience hurt, that then we approach every relationship after in a way to guard ourselves from being hurt again? Because we have experienced things that are uncomfortable or painful, we then begin to set guards, which actually, if we are not careful, can limit us from our experience and our hope and our belief. Scripture is clear that hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hallelujah. But a desire fulfilled, hallelujah. It, 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 somebody help me. It, it's the fruit of life, something like that, right? Something like that. It's in the Bible. You read it. <laughs> hallelujah. But here's the thing, y'all. It's about your, your gaze. It's about where you are looking. Where, where are you living from? What, what realm, what plane are you living from? I told you last week and the week before that Jesus is not an add-on to our lives. 
Jesus isn't something that we do. He's not a hobby. He's not, you know, something that we, we, we say, oh, we're good. We, we, are, we did our, you know, our good duty. We're accomplishing the American dream. We're, you know, we're trying to get our single family home, raise our 2.5 children, uh, you know, get our picket fence and our nice car and our nice job and take our children to church on Sundays and say we're good citizens. That's not the goal. God will not be second to your life. God will not be second to your desires, second to all of these things that we fill our time with. But this is the thing, you know, we often people have this fear of really pressing into God for fear of being viewed as weird, fear of being viewed as religious, fear of being viewed as, I don't know, you know, they say all kinds of things about spirit-filled churches. That's, oh, that's a cult over there. <laughs> What's interesting is you ain't say I was in a cult when I was high out of my mind every day. So drunk I could barely function. You ain't had nothing to say then. All of a sudden I want to worship Jesus. Oh, that's a cult. Be careful. Okay. When I was sleeping around with no protection, all, just all out willy-nilly and, 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 and could have a disease today. But thank you, Jesus. You ain't say nothing then. Ought to be careful. All of a sudden I, I want to be passionate for Jesus. I want to have a little noise for Jesus. And you look at, oh, you're doing too much. Yeah, that's harmful lifestyle. What? Backwards. We are ate up in our minds. Are y'all with me? Here's the beautiful thing. You know, there is this challenge. And I will say this to the church today. We do have to have a, a clear understanding of biblical principles because though we are called to be heavenly minded and to set our things, our mind on things above, that doesn't mean that we dwell up in the space, right? Untouchable, uh, 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 unin touch with reality, out of touch with people's lives and people's pain and people's brokenness. You know, nothing is more irritating than somebody that can speak in a whole lot of tongues but cannot understand pain. <laughs> cannot understand a, a, a life, day-to-day -day life. Are y'all with me? One of the most heavenly minded people in your scripture was the man Christ Jesus. He came from heaven. Hallelujah. He had no earthly father. Hallelujah. He was very God of very God. He was God in the flesh. The Godhead. Hallelujah. Made uh, a flesh and walking among us. He was a heavenly minded being. But he labored, he worked, he sweated, he cried, he touched, he healed, he reached. He never stopped doing the work, though he was heavenly minded. And he set an example for us when he was with his disciples and he said, I have to steal away to pray just for a moment. Can you watch and pray with me but for an hour? Are y'all with me? We're about to be done. Let's go to Mark 4. We're going to wrap up. I know y'all cold. Mark 4, right? Mark 4. It's in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, then Luke and John. Amen. <laughs> y'all feel all right? Is this making sense? The call of God this morning is that we would, hallelujah, that we would set our gaze on him that we would set our gaze on eternity, that we would understand that we are living to live again. Amen. Matthew, Mark, are you in Mark? Chapter number four, let's look at verse 14. We're gonna be quick, we're gonna get out of here. The food is hot and I'm sure y'all ready to eat. P.S., anyone that's here today, you're welcome to join us after for some amazing food. I cooked some good macaroni and cheese and some phenomenal baked beans. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all kinds of food back there. The saints, thank you to each of you that have helped uh, to make that possible today. Amen. Mark 4, are you there? 14, it says this, Mark 4 and 14, the sower soweth the word. This is Jesus, these words in red. He, he had just given the parable of the sower uh, to the masses. And when he got alone with the disciples, the disciples are saying, hey, can you explain this uh, parable to us that you just taught? We want to understand. Are y'all right? Verse 15. And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan comes immediately 
and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. When the word of God is going forth and the word of God is being preached or you are receiving the word of God in whatever capacity you receive the word of God, you've got to know that Satan is waiting right there waiting for you to receive it because as soon as you get it he wants to snatch it from you he wants to make sure that it takes no root in your heart so it goes in one ear and out the other that's why the devil have you sitting in a room like this today listening to the word of god but your mind is distracted can't stop thinking about what you're going to do after you leave here can't stop thinking about whether you left the lights on at the house y'all with me because he wants to snatch the word out of your heart so that it does not take root. Are you with me? Verse 16, and these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Hallelujah. And have no root in themselves. And so they endure for a little while. But afterward, when affliction or persecution comes for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. I want you to see what Jesus is saying because these words are not light words. He's saying immediately. When the word of God comes, he says, there are some of you in this room today or watching via live stream today. You will receive this word quick and you'll be glad about it. But because there's no root in you, it won't last. You'll get halfway through Monday and stuff will begin to come against you and you will forget what it is that you have heard. Are you with me? What verse we in? 17. He said, immediately they are offended. People like that are people who they sit in church, they hear the word, they get glad about it. It's like a Tylenol pill. Y'all ever had a headache? Raise your hand if you ever had a headache. Most of us, right? Okay, headache. You take a Tylenol pill. I don't know what you like. Ibuprofen, Tylenol, Motrin, whatever you take, right? And it takes about 20 minutes. My wife's a pharmacist. She tells me about 20 minutes <laughs> till it kicks in. About 20 minutes, it kicks in, headache goes away. But if you have a persistent headache, after a while, it's going to come back. And when it comes back, or whether what, what the scripture is saying in this situation, persecution arises or some kind of trouble arises in your life or some kind of issue that you go through, immediately you're offended. Mad at God, mad at the word, mad at the church when it was you that had no root. Are y'all with me? He said, you, you immediately go into offense, and this is why you can't grow. Hallelujah. Verse 18, are you there? And then there are those which are sown among thorns, such as, these are people who hear the word, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Hallelujah. They come, and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becomes what unfruitful the scripture is saying there are some people who will hear the word of god and they will receive it and they will even take it in but because of the cares of this world your bills are due family got so many needs and so many issues children can't get them to act right Hallelujah. Cares of this world. You're worried about who, who's in the, in the White House. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you got all the cares of this world uh, and it, it gets in. That's what it says. The scripture says it enters in. It might be the cares of this world. Maybe it's the deceitfulness of riches. God give you a little bit. It's not enough. I want some more. I want some more. I want some more. God, look at them. They seem to be doing well. What's wrong with me? What do I need to do? Maybe I need to get another job, another job, another hustle, another this. And the hustle and the bustle of life is the deceitfulness of riches. The idea that if you get enough, then you'll be satisfied. I want you to know I know a whole lot of wealthy people and they are very unhappy. Not to say all, because I know some very happy wealthy people, but those are people who put God first, I'm trying to tell you. But I know some people who think that if they get enough money, all their cares will go away. But I want you to hear the prophet from the 90s that came out and he said, more money, more problems. 
Y'all want to hear no talk? I'm trying to tell you. The more money I come about, the more problems I see. Jesus. He said the deceitfulness of riches. And then he said, what did he say? He said the lust, right? He said it could be even the lust of other things. When they enter in, they choke the word. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen anybody being choked. I'm not going to ask you if you've ever been choked. It might cause trauma. But I'm asking you if you've ever seen, maybe in a movie or something. What happens is the, 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 the ability to breathe, the ability to live, it, it is choked out of you. And in the same picture, God, Jesus is saying here, he's saying the word came in, but them other things choked the life out of the word and you were unfruitful. You didn't allow the, the, the word of God to bear fruit because you allowed these other things to enter in. You got to check your doors and your gates. You got to ask yourself today, are there things that are entering in? Are there things that have your heart other than God? I told you on Wednesday, those of you that were here for our, uh, we're doing our build series on Wednesday night and we talked on Wednesday. I told you, me and my wife have been talking. We believe in God for a lot of things, but we had this conversation the other day. I said, babe, we can't never love money. You can't never love money. I said, we got to pray constantly, Lord. And we pray every day, Lord, don't never let us love money. We want money. Somebody here wants the money? Okay. The scripture tells us money answer all things. Money is good. You can accomplish a lot with some money, right? It's quiet in this church. I'm telling you, you can accomplish a lot with some money. But the scripture is clear. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. I'm trying to tell you, all you got to do is look out at the world system today and you will see the love of money is the root of some evil, evil things. I remember when my sister was dying of cancer and she had to have treatments every week. Them treatments were some $30,000. Evil. And they can charge those prices because when you're put in a life and death situation, they know you're going to come up with the money. It's evil, evil, the love of money. When it takes pennies to create some of these drugs and insolence that people need to live and we charge hundreds of dollars to fulfill a prescription. It's evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. You're with me. When we pad pockets and put people in positions in the FDA and all of these different things to pass stuff through because we know that their families are making money off of it, it is a wicked and an evil day because of the love of money and the greed in our hearts. Hallelujah. It chokes the word. Are you with me? We're almost done. This is our last scripture. Verse 19. He said, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lusts of other things, they enter in, they choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Verse 20. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, and they receive it, and they bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. When you set your eyes on him, I don't know why you're here today or what you're in it for, or where you're at on your, in your walk with God. But what I want to tell you is this, that wherever you're at on the journey, set your eyes on him. And when you receive the word of God, you take that before him in prayer. God wants to have communion with you. Yup, you. Hallelujah. Pray for me, pastor. I will. But he wants to hear from you. When you stand before God, I'm not going to be there. Your sister, your brother not going to be there. Your mama, your daddy not going to be there. It's going to be you and God. And there's no reason to be intimidated. He said, come before me. Bring all your cares and your burdens. You know, we go through this life and we have all of this stuff on our plates. God is not intimidated and he's not untouched with the feeling of your infirmity. He says, bring that stuff before me. You got to take it to the Lord and say, God, listen, I'm not feeling it today. Help me. Teach me. Show me. Help me to balance. I told y'all the other day, I think I told y'all, maybe I told this on Wednesday night. There are days when, my, when, when fathering is overwhelming because I didn't have no good example. Nobody taught me how to be a dad. I don't know. Much less a godly one because I don't come from Christians. Hallelujah. And so here I got this little two-year-old and this little eight-month-old 
boys no less. And I'm like, God, I'm gonna need your help. The other day, my wife was at work. Both the kids got to screaming. I ain't know what to do. <laughs> I said, Jesus, you're gonna have to help me. I said, hey, hey, we got to quiet down in here. It didn't help. They screamed louder. I said, God, I need help. Amen. But whatever it may be, that's just a light example. But you follow me. We take this stuff before the Lord. Say, God, teach me. Show me. Lord, I'm overwhelmed. Maybe you find yourself in a position where you know God said. He gave you, he gave you a word, gave you a promise. And things aren't working out the way you thought they were supposed to work out. You bring that before the Lord. You say, Father, what's going on? I trust you, but I don't understand. If you could just help me and either give me instruction or give me peace. Give me one. Are you with me? We take that stuff before the Lord, but we set our eyes on him. This eternal gaze and eternal focus. Everything we do, we don't come in this room and gather in this room just because it's Sunday morning and we need something to do. It's cold outside. Heck, it's cold in here. I'd rather be home. My heat's on 74. Some of y'all, that's how, you know my mama, side note, <laughs> buddy trailer, my mom thinks 69 is heat. I went to her house and I was like, ma, it's freezing in here. Can I please turn the heat on? She said, yeah, you can put it on 69. I said, what? <laughs> that, is, that is freezing. It's cold. Anyway, side note, we have other things we could be doing, but we're in this room today because we have encountered the creator. And we have this eternal gaze where he says, hey, I want to fellowship with you. We can all pray from our homes with our personal prayer. But the scripture tells us not to forsake the gathering of yourselves together. Why? Because something miraculous happens when we gather together in his name. He said, come, let us magnify the Lord. Let us exalt his name together. Something miraculous happens in the corporate setting. That's why we are here to learn of him, to encourage one another and build one another up and pray and bless one another as we experience the Father. There's a reason why we come together for prayer. Well, God, if you know my thoughts before I think them, then what's the point of prayer? Eternal, eternal mindset. I, you pass from time into eternity in the place of prayer and you exchange. That's why the book of Isaiah says, come plant the heavens with the word of God. That's why the scripture says, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your ways. And that's why he says, come up here. When you come up in the place of prayer, he gives you strategy and he gives you answers and he gives you peace and it causes you to move from time into eternity and then back into time to implement what it is that he told you. Are you with me? Hallelujah. God, he wants us so set on eternity that though our outward man perish day by day, our inward man is renewed. I don't know about you. I've been walking with the Lord 16 years now and I'm not tired yet. I plan on running until I run out of here. Hallelujah. They had a saying back in the day, the old saints used to say, if I can't say a word, I'll just wave my hand. I want to be so full of the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, that even if I can't open my mouth and vocalize, I'll rock my body. And even if I can't rock my body, I'll tap my foot. Whatever it is, I'm going to give expression to the eternal God which lives on the inside of me. Hallelujah. And when you have your mind set on eternity, when you have your mind, it, it, something happens when you allow God to take you to this eternal place. When you allow God to elevate your heart and elevate your mind and elevate your thinking. You know, the cares of this world, I, there is a song, the songwriter said, you know, as I gaze upon him, the things of this world grow strangely dim. What begins to happen is things that used to really bother you, they just don't bother you no more. Things, you know, people come tell you, Nick, they say, hey, you got 30 days. And you're like, well, amen. This, this Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they were facing impending doom. They were about to be thrown into the fiery furnace. It was so hot that the men that turned the heat up died just from being close to the heat. Go read your Bible. And here's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're not over there like, oh my God, what are we going to do? They're standing there, 
firm foundation. Unshakable. Unmovable. You know, the songwriter picked it up and say, if, if, if uh, Christ be for me, who can stand against me? Right? He said, O oh, king, our God is able to deliver. So I'm going into this. He might deliver me. He might not. But either way, I know he can. And because I know who he is, I'm not worried about it. I'm just going to go ahead in by faith and trust that the outcomes are going to work in my favor. Why? Romans 8, 28. All things are working together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Hallelujah. When your heart is set on a pilgrimage to eternity, keep your mind on things above. What begins to happen is that unshakable faith that you hear so frequently about, that's how it gets settled in. But that unshakable faith, that's what the devil is after. That's what he's trying to keep you from. That's why he wants you to have moments with God. But moments don't last. I don't want just moments. I want legacy. I want a legacy of faith that could pass from generation to generation to generation. I told them on Wednesday night, I want to have a faith, a relationship with God that breaks chains and opens up doors and possibilities and opportunities so that when my children come, Hallelujah. They're able to say the God of my father. I've seen him do it for him. So I know he can do even more for me. <laughs> Hallelujah. There are things that God will do in your life when you set your mind on him. That for some of us who are the first generation entering into this, hallelujah, it's like, you know, you, you see things happen that you never dreamed possible and you're like, wow. But you know that there's more out there to be had. So your children and your children's children, hallelujah, what you were able to accomplish becomes the floor. Hallelujah. And they're able to reach for the stars, whatever it is that God would want them to do. Are you with me? I don't want to have a moment with God. I want to have a legacy, a life full. Build your hope on things eternal. Hallelujah. When we build our life on things eternal. Hallelujah. When we've been given access by this great God to set our minds on things above, to be renewed in our mind day by day by day. I want you to know this as we prepare to close this morning that the devil and your flesh, you're not going to want to serve God every day. You're not even going to feel saved every day. Some days you're going to wake up, you're going to be irritated. You're going to be tired. You're going to be frustrated. Things are going to happen. You're going to have to put yourself in check. Just this morning, I had to put myself in check. I looked myself in the mirror and said, now, Carl, calm down. I'm just telling you my story. I don't know your story. I said, now, Carl, calm down. He's either God or he's not. Take a breath, it's going to be a good day. Hallelujah. But the devil and your flesh will try to wear you out. Because if he can get you in this moment of up and down, roller coaster faith, in and out, save today, tomorrow, I don't know, then what happens is you're never able to build a legacy of faith that causes transformational change and causes there to be a light that is shining. If you are constantly turning your light on and off, people on the outside in darkness look in and they say, I would like to believe that you have the light. But I don't know, because sometimes it's on, sometimes it's off. Y'all with me? But when you set your heart on things that are eternal, what happens is it elevates your mind into that place of the impossible. That God, though I am weak and frail, even with my weak, yes, my, my, my weak, yes, God, with my flaws and my faults, and I got a whole lot of work to do, hallelujah, but I'm giving you my weak, yes, and I'm putting my faith in an eternal.
eternal God who is not afar off in the cloud somewhere but is sitting right down here on the inside of my belly he gave me all things hallelujah that pertain to life and godliness I can't be stopped because I serve an eternal God are y'all with me let's stand we're gonna pray I hope this bless you this morning hallelujah